Zimbabwe, home to approximately 13 million people. A significant amount of the population is in the diaspora, having moved out because of political and economic reasons. Zimbabweans are now spread across the globe, spanning countries like the United Kingdom, the United States of America, South Africa, just to name a few. Most Zimbabweans only really know one president. President Robert Gabriel Mugabe. Mugabe was elected as a leader in the 1980s and has been president for nearly 40 years. His presidency has been criticized by press, political opposition, internal members of the government and the international community. During his leadership, he has been accused of causing economic hardship and severely violating human rights. Following the much contested elections of 2008 that saw the country grind to an economic halt with record-breaking global inflation. The next few years saw a rise in protests and activists against Mugabe's presidency. Meanwhile, new voices started emerging on the internet and social media, speaking against Mugabe's regime. Itai Tamara's Occupy Unity Square was the movement that started a tidal wave of activists speaking against Mugabe online. Tajamuka is one of the leading social media movements online. They successfully called for a stay away in 2016 and organized a number of protests. This is Promise Mukwananzi, the leader of Tajamuka. But I would say that uh, from my standpoint, it is one of those necessary evils that the army had to do. And as I said earlier on, I'm happy with the manner that they have done it. No blood shed, no intimidation, no uh, usurpation of power using extra constitutional means. I think that they've said that Mugabe remains the president as elected and uh, they are persuading him to, to step aside and to allow this country another opportunity behind him. So this is AC Lumumba, a young political figure on the online scene. AC has been pretty vocal in his opinion on Mugabe. Here we ask AC what his current thoughts are on the former president. I feel very sorry for the president, you know, very sorry, because I remember being a 19-year-old and first time really interacting with ZANU-PF politics uh, from a distance, you know, it was almost like I've, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a young girl and there's a guy I see in the classroom and I think this guy is so hot and, I'm, and people ask me, why do you think this guy is so cool? I'm like, oh, look at the way he dresses, look at the way he speaks, I mean, just look at the way he commands a crowd. Typical to why girls like guys and I remember being a 19-year-old kid having, having no idea that I'd ever meet this man and saying, wow. I think that is so cool. Listening to his promise and the way he articulated it, and I thought, this is exactly what Africa needs. And then the closer I got to the proximity of power now, I mean, I now go to a point where I was having meetings with this man one-on-one. -on -one. I was flying and traveling with this man, and I started realizing, ooh, something is really wrong with this relationship. It was one thing before Tanyengana. Patakanyengana, Tagudanana, blas vaibaiza. After the wave of protests, Mkabe was left with very few legal options. Um, I think in terms of the constitution, the president can either be removed, and this is when we now talk about the impeachment process, or he can resign, um, or if he unfortunately um, passes away, then, you know, either th that then kicks in as well. So his options really were to, to resign or to be subject to the impeachment process. And what the impeachment process would have done is we would have people coming forward to say, Mr. President, you have failed to either uphold the constitution or due to your health or old age, you are unable to continue executing your duties in the right manner. You have failed to, um, to, uh, to, to put into force the policies that uh, you are supposed to be safeguarding. And with these allegations should have come facts of the charge, should have come an investigation, and it would have been an inquest. The president would have been given an opportunity to answer to these charges, and an entire inquest would have then been held then the result afterwards would have been uh, you know, an unceremonious stripping of power. So I think that the resignation in the circumstances was the best option to take. And I really wish it had come sooner. So I, I would really like to applaud 
um, you know, the former president for taking this, this, this route because at least he has managed to leave his legacy intact and he has walked away without necessarily causing or calling any sort of um, interrogation into how he, did, um, how he did manage his tenure as president. So in his resignation, it obviously means now that we are without a president. And this should then be rectified within 48 hours, which I believe has been done. People were very opinionated and didn't hesitate to give their views on the former leader. Kara <laughs> In the past, Robert Mugabe has come down hard on activists and anyone who has an opinion that differs from his own. Some of these activists were charged with crimes as serious as treason. First of all, I want to thank you all for being resilient since morning on empty stomachs waiting for the verdict. Right now, the update that we have is that the state is changing the charges what? to subversion of constitutional powers. Uh -huh. In sim simply put, it means that they now want to charge Pastor Ivan with treason. So I think November 18, uh, when the military and ZANU PF fell, you know, broke ranks, if you want, with, with Robert Mugabe, they took advantage of a public sentiment that they know they've suppressed for the longest of time. So the victory was not really a ZANU PF victory for me. It wasn't, you know, a military victory per se. We are glad that they finally saw the light and they finally started to speak with the people. But I looked at it as, um, you know, a moment where our um, state apparatus, a moment where, you know, ZANU PF came and joined the people in the fight against the regime as represented by Robert Mugabe. So, yeah, that's the 18 November for me really was a people's victory. You know what, last kicks of a dying horse. I mean, Mugabe um, is by no means naive. He is aware of the fact that this is, this is the end, um, fully aware of that. I think two things that I saw, number one is that um, obviously he, he, to some degree, wants to control the optics of how he leaves power and he wants to live on his own terms. Um, that's the stubborn man he's always been in, in politics and even in how, how he's run. I mean, to, to lose an election in 2008 and then to, again, simply say no. Um, but this time what is different is that his entire party is against him. Uh, the military is against him. So his options are very few. I mean, we, we will be seeing impeachment proceedings proceeding in, this, in the next few days. Um, and as much as he can, he can, he, Yesterday, he refused to resign. I mean, from what I've heard is that he, he deliberately just basically, you know, wasn't prepared to just say that I, I you know, resign as president sort of thing. Um, and he was prepared to hold on um, in the hope of something. Um, but the pressure is going to be too great. Uh, the people have spoken. The people are going to continue to speak. And it is now more than ever that we will, con we will rise and say, look, we will not leave the streets until he vacates office. And the military is fully behind us, which is what we've always needed. Because these type of actions were never possible because the security forces would clamp down on people. The intelligence, the central intelligence, the police would arrest people. The ZANU PF itself, its party members would be the biggest, you know, in 2008. They were the ones going out and preventing 
um, the MDC and Morgan Changirai from occupying the seat of power, even though he had won the election. Um, so all that machinery has been completely taken down. And I think what is good now is to see that, you know, we, we can't cry over spilled milk. Yes, it would have been nice that this happened in 2008, but we are happy that finally the war vets, the military, um, and ZANU-PF itself has realized that the situation is unsustainable. They've realized that it is necessary for us to move on into a new era. Um, and they want freedom themselves. I think, if anything, what this economy has done to people, one of the biggest factors I always allude to all of this happening is the economic implosion of the country. Uh, we're, we're now in a situation where we're back where we started in 2007, 2008. Hyperinflation, things are going up, salaries are not. You know, everything in supermarkets and basic commodities have gone up by 50%, and yet people still earn the same. And those same people are civil servants who are really getting low salaries that are not growing as far as they need to go. Um, and all of that has now culminated in people within Zanopia realizing that it is not sustainable. The trough that, we, that, that they were drinking from is now finished. So even for them, even for a lot of people within Zanopiev, it is that awakening that it is time that we either get with the program and get rid of the problem once and for all, or we will all literally uh, be thrown back into the Stone Age and poverty and all these sort of things that have really started to happen. Um, the gains that people even made during the inclusive government era, a lot of them eroded. You know, people had invested, you know, it was an era of stability where people made massive economic gains and all of those gains have been eroded by the last four years of Robert Mugabe's continued uh, ruinous policies, continued um, failed governance, arrogance, um, um, unsustainable spending of, of state resources on frivolous things, on his own trips, on his family. You know, we're hearing reports of how some of his officials are, are were found with, 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 with wads of money and things like that. I mean, just the level at which that they had looted the Zimbabwean economy and just for a small clique of people. And now all of that, I think, is what really pushed people to the edge. To the former president of the country, Robert Gabriel Mugabe. His regime has been blamed for the misfortunes and the economic downfall of the country. I think uh, Zim, you know, we'd gone through a very, uh, really tough um, last, especially 15, 15 years plus. Um, I think there were, you know, a combination of, of, uh, of different factors that led us to, um, you know, to, to where we were. I think um, on the one hand, you need to, you know, take it back uh, pre-independence look at the reality that uh, ZANU-PF inherited the colonial state and the colonial state wasn't you know was was built for an elite to rule over the masses and that's you know uh, it was a very centralized state where power was centralized in the hands of a few um, so I think that's one of you know that's one of the issues I think also economically um, that the ZANU-PF government inherited um, uh, a huge colonial uh, foreign debt which they proceeded to pay um, I think uh, also, in the uh, you know in the uh, early 90s, um, uh, if you look at the kind of protests that, it, that that emerged then, it was very kind of economic justice demands. Um, I think uh, you know a lot of people, uh, especially in the West, go go with the easy narrative that uh, all all of a sudden in the late 90s Bob became bad and that and you know he's he's the issue. Um, I think if you if you take a look at you know the protests that emerged from the ZCTU, the big stayaways, the, stu the big student mobilisation, um, it was a lot of economic demands to start off with. Um, we had had uh, failed um, economic structural adjustment programs, you know, all these reforms pushed through by the IMF and World Bank, um, uh, and these were failed economic policies that also came from the West. After ruling for nearly forty years and finally stepping down in 2017 on the 20th of November. Zimbabweans have found a newfound liberty and are looking forward to a great and wonderful new Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe, 
Because that is why no else can carry me like that. Why go to Chile no go pushwa? Go to Chile, Chile, Chile. Aye wa, drop him from so. Aye ura ya mundo. Is a killer. Is susu. Do not turn. I can feel me run away. Le kuti asika pa stage ya chile nasi. Chipo chukombo roo pa asina kudenga. Chita kaya tiri kwa nchi. Unu wese ari pana apa, wese pana ari pana apa. Pani ma pati zaka wanda ati sukuma marana. Because we do not make a chile show si Zimbabwe. We fight Zimbabwe kumunu wese. Ati na kuruwira kutu uyu kwake uyu kwake. Tusunungu ketese. Tiada cina, cuma cerita. Nampak tu nak kufir, cerita kamu kan dalam panas. Kamu cakap kamu yang very happy. Kau sih cakap mana semua anak nukasar buat cerita drama rise sedu. Ima grip sedu pasti nak kuskan, pasti nak cerah. Ima grip sedu 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 pasti nak cerah. Ima it's okay. What we are trying to do is to remove our old man. He is now old. There are people who captured our old man. The thieves and his wife captured him. And all the other couples who were stealing our money. The people you are seeing here are not working. All these people who are here are not working. Some are educated. They have masters, they have a PhD, but they are not working. People who are working, they work and work, they go to the bank, they get ten dollars. What is that? You come from Murewa, you need five dollars to go, you need five dollars to come to Harare, you are given ten dollars. What will that ten dollars help? You won't get anything out of that money. They were also promoting roadblocks everywhere. And if I'm not mistaken, this money was entering into Chuhuri's account. And it will be distributed to all these NPF functionaries, which is not okay for Zimbabwe. My friend, we have been working, but look at me. I'm educated. I don't have money right now, even a single cent to go home. So what do you think? Is that a country? Um, so, you know, I think, I think um, you know, the Zim crisis is, is multifaceted and we can't just look at uh, Mugabe and Zanu PF. So, I mean, t t take a look at the colonial legacy, um, the, the hierarchical state that, that we inherited, um, economic policies that were foisted on us by the West. Um, I think uh, in terms of Zanu PF itself, I think definitely what they, they did is they, you know, they took over the state and used it as a means of accumulation. Um, of, of building up their own wealth, um, be, that, be that through corrupt deals, tenders, blatant looting, uh, taking over of, uh, of land and farms. Um, so I think, of course, they're very much, you know, they're very much to blame uh, also. Uh, I think it was also then sped up in the, you know, uh, you know, from kind of 99, 2000 uh, onwards, um, when, uh, I th you know, I think Zanupia felt that for the first time ever they were they were actually being challenged and could lose an election. They were being challenged by these new emerging, uh, you know, um, powerful forces, the ZCTU with the workers, the Zinasu with the students, uh, a new party, the MDC. Um, uh, and so they also had to now start uh, building, up, uh, building up support from different social forces. Um, and so that's also why you know, the, uh, the land reform issue all of a sudden became important to zanu -PF. It should have been important to them from 1980. Uh, it became important to them because, the, you know, one, it's, that's, a, that's an electoral, it's an electoral gimmick. Uh, and it just, that was after they'd been defeated in the constitutional referendum. They knew they could lose elections. Um, so I think they used land reform as a gimmick, but at the same time, uh, it was a way um, to uh, use the, you know, use, get the war veterans on board as a uh, as a as a movement behind them to get the rural population on board uh, behind them, of course, because the majority of our population lives in rural areas, um, and um, and yeah, and then I think uh, you know, of course, you know, they won the 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 2000 elections. Since then, 
uh, Zanupiev has been in campaign mode. Uh, for, for every election, the economy s suffered hugely with you know, the hyperinflation that we had in 2008, um, where uh, you know, basically it cost you a trillion dollars to buy a beer. Uh, um, and yeah, the, the, in terms of economic policy, they, 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 they just had a disastrous economic policy. Politically, they were focused on staying in power, not on improving people's lives. Um, and so, yeah, we got to this point where we really we were now being led by a 93 year old uh, man who uh, was uh, more focused on the factional fights within within his own party than the fact that you know the economy was crumbling once again in Zimbabwe where we had cash you know uh, cash shortages uh, and unemployment ranging from anything between 80 percent to 95 percent. The air in Zimbabwe is certainly very different. We look forward to new things. The people are optimistic and they're ready to build a new Zimbabwe.